Okay, everyone. Well, welcome. This is um, our first Historic Districts Coalition training session, uh, part of a series. Um, so a little bit about where this uh, came from. We hosted a training for our HCRC commissioners earlier this year. Um, that recording was available on the web and on TVSA, and a few of you saw it um, and reached out to me regarding a similar training um, for Historic District residents and coalition leaders. Um, so what we've done is I, I worked with Barbara Woodhall, with Ricky Krishner, Monica Savino, and Tom Hughes uh, regarding uh, some of the content ideas, things that we think are most pertinent and useful to, to you all. Um, and because there is a lot of content, we've decided to break it down into to a series of parts um, so that we can post individual recordings on the web. And hopefully the, the recordings are more useful to you in the future versus a longer recording. Um, let me introduce myself. I am Corey Edwards. I am a Deputy Historic Preservation Officer with the City of San Antonio Office of Historic Preservation. Um, I oversee our design review program. Um, with us on the call, um, we have Edward Hall, a Senior Historic Preservation Specialist, Stephanie Phillips, also a Senior Specialist, um, our Director, Shannon Miller, who's also the Historic Preservation Officer, um, Rachel Retaliata, who is a Preservation Specialist, and uh, Katie Todman, who's a Specialist. And I, I believe many of you have worked with um, all of us, um, if not some of us, um, and so uh, we wanted to maintain uh, that familiarity with staff as we as we go through these items. Okay, um, so I mentioned that this is part of a series. Um, these are sort of the the upcoming uh, sessions that that we have planned now. Um, so today is going to be all about the certificate of appropriateness process, how they come to us, how we review them what happens when they're issued and what happens after they're issued. Um, this is mostly gonna focus on the administrative side of uh, the COAs, um, what happens when staff approves those. There's also, as you know, a process by which those go to the HCRC, our Historic and Design Review Commission for review and approval. Um, and so that's gonna be the next session. And so there's a lot of kind of nuts and bolts things associated with that process that we will not get into today. Uh, but if you do have questions about that, um, go ahead and leave them in the chat. And if it makes sense to address them here, we will. Um, the third will be um, design guidelines, our historic design guidelines and related policy documents, how those are implemented and, and how they inform the certificate of appropriateness review process. Um, the fourth will be the demolition and designation process. And then after all of this, um, we are going to take your feedback. Uh, if there's anything that we missed or or you would like highlighted from the previous sessions, we will do a fifth session that is the people's choice and, and it'll be sort of a, 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 a catch all of, of anything that's remaining. Um, so this session about the COA process is also gonna be broken into sections. And so these, these are sort of the main points that we're gonna capture. Um, what is a certificate of appropriateness? When is it required for you? Um, how can you apply for one? What is the process and sort of the um, internal review process associated with that? Um, how are they reviewed by staff and what does the approval look like? And then what are some online resources available for you all? Um, at the end of each of these sort of segments, we will get into Q&A. Um, so don't worry about waiting until the end. Uh, if you have something uh, that pops into your mind based on a slide that you see your information, um, go ahead and put it in the chat and we will get to it. Um, Patricia, yes, these slides will be available. And like I said, the recording will be posted on our website for future reference. Um, so uh, stepping back a little bit, um, an overview of our department, uh, we do have different program areas. We are a very uh, small department compared to other city departments. Um, we have 20 positions, um, 19 of them are currently filled. Um, and we have different program areas in which staff is generally assigned to. Um, so we have a couple of archeologists, as you know, um, we have our vacant buildings team that manages that program. Um, we have Scout SA, which is our, our uh, demolition and designations uh, staff. That's a team of two. Um, and then we have three positions assigned to living heritage. That is our cultural heritage initiatives, our trade education that we're developing and, and some of the legacy business program and some of those efforts. Um, we have a program that is education outreach that we all participate in. Um, that's, that's basically this. Um, kind of working within the public and providing information and resources. Um, the design review uh, program is our, our biggest program in terms of assigned staff. Uh, we have about seven assigned staff to that program. 
And so that is uh, permits, certificates of appropriateness, the HCRC process, enforcement, and anything related to development. Um, this information is on our website. Um, I sent a link out uh, to people who registered. That's the before getting started page. And so this is on that page. Um, we actually have made the decision to um, divide our staff geographically. Um, so if you live in a certain historic district, um, you know who to contact more routinely. Most people just call Katie, but <laughs> she is our, our primary customer uh, uh, intake person. And so she, she deals with a lot of customers on a daily basis. But if you're going to HCRC or you have a question about what would require a certificate or what might require HCRC review, um, these are your people. So Edward Hall and BFAM oversee the downtown business district. Um, we, they've been very involved in the rollout of 5G network nodes and installations on city right away, which is something that not a lot of you see, but it has been happening a lot in our downtown area. Um, the Rio districts are river improvement overlay districts, um, as well as the, the list of historic districts you see on the left. Um, Stephanie and Rachel oversee individual landmarks, um, public property, um, so things on parks, uh, public plazas, right-of-way projects, um, and the historic districts you see there. Um, we also have, like I said, Katie Tomman, who's doing our, our mostly sort of our administrative review and intake. Um, we also have Lauren Sage, who is our management analyst. Um, she does a lot of uh, programs related to um, our outreach. She handles our realtor training. Um, she also is our agenda uh, person, and so she's the one helping uh, organize everything and, um, and make sure that what is uh, being posted on the agenda is accurate for, for the public uh, information. Um, so we just got a question in chat, and this, I hope, answers it the next few slides. Um, generally, um, so our program is guided by the Unified Development Code. Um, there is enabling ordinances. Um, there's sections on where our authority is, um, what requires a COA and when, um, who does the reviews and what happens um, publicly, what are the notification requirements, um, what are the applicable standards and guidelines that we, uh, that we must follow in our reviews, um, and then when a decision is made, what does, that, what does that mean and how are those appealable? Um, so this is just a screenshot. The, the UDC is available on the web. Um, the city subscribes to a service called Unicode. And so a lot of cities um, have their code of ordinances available on the web uh, through this site. Um, it is, you can see the URL there at the top. If you just Google um, San Antonio Unicode, you should be able to find it. Um, you'll see the code of ordinances, which is most of the, the city laws, but then there's also chapter 35 of the code of ord uh, ordinances, which is the Unified Development Code. So this is the largest chapter. It really guides um, permit review and development, zoning regulations, and that's where all of our stuff lives. Um, so there's a couple places here in Chapter 35, of the, which is the UDC, um, that, that govern our process. Article 4 is procedures. Um, that is where um, the COA process is authorized. Um, a little, little bit about the, the timers and, and requirements for review. And then Article 6 is mostly where the standards and guidelines live. And so there's references to the historic design guidelines. There's all of the Rio and downtown design guide standards are, are in that section. Um, and generally, um, what is authorized is that a certificate of appropriateness, um, which is an approval from the historic preservation officer, is required if you for properties within one of the 32 local historic districts. Um, we have about 1,600 individual local landmarks. Some are in districts, some are freestanding, and, and the COAs are required there. Um, we have seven river improvement overlay districts. Um, so that's going to generally follow the San Antonio River and San Pedro Creek areas. Um, and those are intended to guide, to guide um, mostly new construction, um, but it also does capture um, significant building alterations as well. Um, same with downtown zoning. Um, so uh, if you are in the downtown business district, there is a design guide that applies to that property, um, mostly in terms of new construction, but again, so substantial building alterations and additions are also reviewed under that guide. Um, public facilities, right away projects, public parks, um, those are all subject to review. Um, uh, we also have purview over um, height in um, view shed districts and the mission protection overlay districts. Um, so there is one view shed for the Alamo right now. Um, and so there is a review uh, for projects in that Alamo view shed in regards to height. Um, and then there's four district or four mission protection overlay districts for the four southernmost missions, um, which also are a, a review of height. 
Um, and then property is determined eligible for designation. We're going to get into this more during the um, demolitions and designations uh, session, um, but there is a mechanism under which properties that are going th actively going through the designation process are subject to review. Um, we've got a quick question to explain view sheds. Um, it is really just a tool in the UDC that allows us to, to govern height, especially in zoning districts where height is not normally regulated. Um, for instance, the Alamo view shed in particular is in the downtown district, and that downtown district does not regulate height. And so um, that was really developed in concern of um, tall buildings being constructed behind the Alamo, so that if you're visiting the Alamo or taking photos of the Alamo, you would then see something kind of encroaching that, that blue sky behind it. Um, and so it is a height restriction based on where you are located in, um, in compared to the Alamo. Okay, um, so to kind of simplify things, we're kind of keeping uh, the context in two buckets here. Um, the first one you see in blue is um, the process by which a certificate of appropriateness application comes to us, what that review looks like, and then what happens. Um, the second you see in red is, okay, uh, a COA has been issued, now what? And so there is sort of a um, back-end process uh, tied to that, um, which is the plan and permit review, and, and I'll get into that as well. Um, and also for context, again, this session is mostly about the administrative review process. Um, for, for all COAs, there's a 10-day completeness review period, um, and I'll get into that in a future slide. Um, and what, what that appeal of completeness can look like. Um, but generally, our policy is that if we have an application that's eligible for administrative approval, we do take, take action on that within 24 hours or 48 hours, as soon as possible, depending on what time of day it came in. But generally, it's same-day turnaround. Um, our our one-stop lobby, um, here where our office is located, did close uh, for several months during uh, COVID. Um, and so, all of our applications have been coming in online, and so we are able to get them um, as soon as possible and review them and reach out to those applicants um, prior to the closure. And now that it's reopened, um, any customer can come in and work with us to get a same day approval, but we do encourage online still at the moment. Um, HDRC review um, is a slightly longer process because we do uh, prepare a more in-depth review um, for public information. There's notification requirements. And so all in all, that's about a two and a half week process um, before, um, from when an application received to when a decision is made. Um, this information is also on our website. There, there are things, and it is kind of a gray area, about um, what does not require certificate of appropriateness on a, a property. Usually we're talking about residential properties. Uh, we get calls from homeowners all the time asking if certain scopes of work require certificate. Um, generally, um, the code is intended to capture things that are permanent or physical changes to a historic property. And so um, there are a lot of things that you can do to your property that aren't quite meeting the threshold of requiring a COA. Um, things like bird baths, um, temporary decorations, um, lawn ornaments, uh, art, freestanding sculptures, uh, routine yard maintenance. Um, these are things that don't typically require a certificate, but we always encourage people who aren't sure if their project requires a COA to call and ask. Um, so we'll pause right now. Um, is there any questions about what a COA is and when it would be required? I don't think I missed anything in the chat. Not we can continue. Um, there is a question about the basics of governance of OHP, um, who sets policy, provides oversight and funding, et cetera. Um, the answer is city council. Um, so generally speaking, um, our form of government allows the city council to set the policy, and then our job as staff is to administer the policy. And so we have um, an ordinance from as early as the 60s, I believe, establishing the first version of the Historic and Design Review Commission. And over time, the designations and kind of rules have have built, um, and so so we are administering decades worth of, of city council direction. Um, the funding is part of the general budget. Um, we we do charge fees associated with our reviews, but those reviews do not necessarily directly uh, fund fund the department. 
Does that answer that question? And there's another question, is that list of items that don't need approval on your website? Yes, it is. It is on the before getting started page. Um, it is a graphic, like we kind of use it on social media sometimes, but um, that link that went out with the registration, you can see, it'll get you to that page. Barbara asks, um, for administrative review, it has been suggested that historic districts be informed of administrative review apps and results. Um, yes, that is actually a change that we are proposing as part of our UDC amendments. Um, and without going into too much detail, um, we are we are looking, um, we worked with the task force all last year, two years ago, um, regarding expanding the administrative approval list. Um, the UDC tells us which items are eligible for administrative approval and an expansion to that list would potentially include larger scale projects that people might want notification of. And so we had uh, proposed working in sort of built in notifications and public access to those projects that are incoming. Are there size limitations of administrative review apps and the results? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I read two questions at once. Um, Alex Soto says, are there any size limitations on items as before a COA might be required? Um, it depends on what the, the request is. Um, so there are uh, footprint uh, limitations to what can be approved administratively for additions or for accessory buildings. And so, yes, it just depends on the type of request. There are some built in uh, limitations and, and that's actually in the next section. If we, uh, Patricia says, if we notice a home project in motion and know there is not a COA who is the best person to contact at OHP. Um, the absolute best way that we recommend is sending an email to OHPReport at SAPreservation.com. Actually, I'm sorry, I could find two email addresses. It's report at SAPreservation.com. And I'll repeat that one more time, report at SAPreservation.com. So that goes to several people. It really goes to our entire design review team. Um, so we do have uh, lead staff for enforcement, but Obviously, if you send an email to multiple people, then you don't have to worry about that person not seeing it or them being out. So we are able to respond most efficiently that way. How many administrative approvals do you think you get a month? Um, it's a lot. Um, we do about 100 a month easily. Um, we issue about 2,200 COAs a year. Two thirds of those are handled administratively. All right, and that, that email address is in the chat. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, let's continue. Um, so I am quickly going to do a demo of where to find the application on our website and what that looks like. So here's the OHP homepage. Um, here's our holiday schedule. I'm right here on the homepage. You can get to a few things. Um, this Explorer map is gonna be um, one of the later um, sessions, but there's a lot, of, a lot of cool things here that that map can do. Um, for information on HCRC schedule, upcoming agendas, um, item scheduled for review, that's this pink button. But for to apply for COA, it's this green button, the application portal. This is a resource we've had for about a year and a half. Um, we went live with it last August. Um, it was pretty well received. Um, we had about 60 to 70% of all of our COAs coming in through this online portal right up until COVID. And then when the building closed, we went to 100% pretty quickly. Um, and so our customers have adjusted pretty well to this uh, new option. Um, because most of our requests are COAs and demolition reviews, those are the two options for the portal at the moment. We are hopefully someday going to expand this to all of our application types, which would include the, the tax verification process and uh, district designation. But for now, it's just these two options. Um, so to apply for a COA, you would just click this button um, so this is really important and a lot of people get confused here when I, because I use Google Chrome, um, 
the browser remembers my information that I type in other websites. And so if I click here, it knows it's looking for an address and it's gonna try to put my home address or other places where I've put in an address. And we don't want that, that messes up the system. Uh, this is really meant to uh, connect with the city's GIS system. And so it's gonna know uh, what addresses are available, which ones exist, and it's going to prompt you to select from the available addresses. This is because um, in the world of data, you want consistency. Um, you don't want uh, uh, streets to be spelled different ways. You don't want them to be, uh, you don't want the east to be on the, after the, the street name, you want it to be at the same place so that, so that the system can find those addresses. Um, so if I start putting in an address, actually, let me put in my home address. If I start to get this, it's always important to hit escape. And then you will see the drop down list. But let me go ahead and put in a um, address that I know is in a historic district. So here's one in King William. If I select an address, it's going to find it um, in our database and it's going to load what it knows about the property. We'll give it a few minutes. So I get a green bar here. It says success, your property has been found. Details have been loaded before or below. Um, so it knows the historic district it's in and knows uh, that it's an individual landmark. Um, it's pooling zoning information. Um, and so the rest, and actually pulls the owner information from BCAD. Um, so if you are the owner, you don't have to do anything additional uh, as, in, except for adding your um, personal information, your phone number and email. Um, a lot of times we have applicants that are not the owner. So this might be a design professional or a contractor. So their information would go here. But if you are the owner, you just click this and it'll load that same information from above. Um, here's where you would go to put in a description of your request. So you might put, I would like to install a new 10 foot wide driveway. Um, and then from this list, you don't have to select something from here, but um, what you would do is find something that looks like your request, driveway and sidewalk, and go ahead and select it. This is really just for um, tracking for us. We can get a feel of uh, the number of requests that are related to driveways or fencing or certain specific requests based on what is captured in this work type field. Um, so here is where it prompts you to submit uh, required uh, materials. Um, so we always require photos and actually we'll get to this further in today's session about um, application requirements. Um, but essentially you would just select that, uh, choose a file from your, your hard drive, upload it and attach it there. Um, it, does say, it does prompt you to fill all of these. Um, a lot of people might just have one file that is you know, a PDF of everything related to the request and so they can just upload that one file. It's not going to kick you out for not completing all of these but we do want people to uh, submit something because their request will be considered incomplete unless they do. Um, there's a few things here, and I don't think I did everything, so let me It's residential. Wants me to put a phone number, I'll put in mine. Okay, so when I submit, um, it's going to give you a request ID. It also sends you this by email, and then we get a copy as well saying that it was submitted so that there's sort of a digital paper trail of an application being submitted. Now from our end, um, it now shows up here for us. So here's the one I just submitted. Um, the other thing that is really neat that it does is this um, allows me to assign it to a staff member. And when I do that, um, I've, I've, well, let me step back. Um, the information is here. And so our intake staff is first going to look at it and make sure it's complete. And I'm going to speak to the completeness review in a little bit. Um, once it's complete, um, they can either, uh, assign it to themselves to take action, or they can assign it to the, the correct, uh, staff based on what district it's in or what geographical area it's in. Um, when we assign it, um, and we've made sure it's complete, it's going to go live on that Explorer map that I'll, I'll talk about at a different session. Um, and so Barbara asked the question about um, things that are coming in for review and will we have a chance to see them? This is how. Um, so uh, if there were attachments, they would be here and those attachments would be available um, on the, that public facing map. 
Um, and don't worry, I'm going to cancel this so that it's not in the system anymore. This isn't a real request, but you can see that that's kind of how it's intended to work. Um, let me see what that question was. Matt asked, could you please comment regarding the respective roles of OHP versus local organizations such as Monta Vista? Um, thank you. Let me, I will put a pin in that and we will respond to that later on. Uh, Monica asks, is there a character limit on the detailed description cell? Um, I, there might be, it's been a while since we programmed it, um, but it's substantial. I think you can put quite a bit of information in there. All right, so let me get out of the browser, get back to, so again, that's the message that you get. Um, so once we do everything um, in the system, we might reach out to you uh, for additional information as part of the completeness review. And again, more detail on that forthcoming. Um, but this is essentially the letter that the system generates. It's the certificate of appropriateness um, if it's approved. Um, so if we approve something administratively, you're gonna get this letter, it's gonna be emailed to you. Um, you then have the ability to print it um, for your own records and then to place on the property. Um, whoever took action, so you saw where I can assign a reviewer, their name is gonna be here, so you have your, your staff point of contact. This language is included on the COA, um, and these are all just disclaimers that we've, we've learned that we need over, over the years. Um, I'll speak a little bit about um, the, valid, the validity of the COA for 180 days. Um, the COA is not taking the place of any required building permits, and so if your project requires a permit, you still need to complete that process. Um, and then also uh, the requirement to keep the certificate posted on the job for the duration of the project. Um, so that was very quick. Um, are there any questions on the online application portal, um, where to go to apply for a certificate, what some required documentation might be? I'm not seeing any questions. Is there a way to apply offline? Um, yes, Scott. Um, we do um, encourage, well, I mean, the answer is kind of no, but so if you were to come in person, we would hand you an iPad. So you're able to do it. You know, we'll, we'll give you the, the thing to do it on, but it's gonna come to us electronically. Um, this is really just kind of a workflow thing. Um, if you give us a piece of paper, then we are entering that into the same database. And so by handing you an iPad, we're able to cut that step out. Hey, Patricia likes it. She says it's user-friendly. Um, there are, it's not perfect. Um, there are strange downtimes that we can't predict. Um, it's usually pretty short. Um, we had somebody try to apply yesterday and it was down, but it came right back up and we can't really explain what's happening there. Um, it is also possible that because the system uses um, verified GIS addresses, it is possible that you might have a property that does not have an address. Um, so either it's in the middle of the replat process or it has a, a proposed address that hasn't been uh, added to the, to the database yet. Um, so in that case, just reach out to staff and we'll work with you on getting an application in. Okay, um, so the application comes to us um, and this is the process. I have one more question. Yeah, um, Patricia says that she recently built a deck in the backyard. Um, she had the mistaken impression that since it was in the backyard, I didn't need OHP review and a COA, and it's a common uh, misconception, which is true. Um, so the review authority is for the property, and so it doesn't really matter if it's in the front yard or the backyard. Now, obviously, backyard interventions tend to be more eligible for administrative approval than in front yard. Um, so that's sort of the distinction. Some things might require commission action if they're more visible. Um, but the, the COA requirement is the same regardless of location on the property. Um, so the application comes to us. The first thing that we do is a completeness review. Um, for most administrative uh, applications, it's gonna be very quick. Um, for new construction applications and or demolitions, partial demolitions, additions, larger scope projects, um, that's going to be a longer completeness review period, and, and I'll explain that in a little bit. 
Um, we have the ability as part of that completeness review to request additional information as necessary. Um, we uh, then determine if it's eligible for administrative approval. Um, we um, pretty much meet daily throughout the week um, and review applications that come in and, and confirm if they're eligible for administrative approval as a team. Um, we also have a, a biweekly HCRC intake meeting where anything that we assume is going to HCRC um, is put into a tracking sheet and we meet as a team and review them all together for completeness. Um, and sometimes we can make the um, determination that something is eligible for administrative approval at that meeting. Um, we then would issue the COA, um, and that might include stipulations if necessary. So we might get an application where it's mostly eligible for administrative approval, but there's something about it that's that's not. And so we might include a stipulation to address that item to make it eligible. And if the, the property owner or the applicant agrees to that stipulation, then we can issue it administratively. Um, and then uh, review-related permit requests that come in following that. Um, so about the completeness review, this is authorized in the UDC. Um, we have 10 days to do it. It's 10 business days. Um, so that's why we're able to we meet bi-weekly to review those HCRC cases as we have enough business days to do that. Um, but again, we try to do it uh, right at the time of receipt of the application, especially for administrative uh, requests, because we do like to issue those as quickly as possible for our customers. Um, so here's where there becomes a gray area, um, is our role is to review it for completeness and accuracy. Um, there are application requirements, minimum requirements in the UDC, depending on the request. And so new construction has certain application requir requirements that must be met in order for it to be considered complete. And those are really easy to say, hey, this thing is missing. Um, but sometimes the documentation we get is just not accurate or the detail of the uh, drawings are not quite uh, what is needed for that level of review. And so we might have to request revised drawings or updated drawings based on, on what is submitted. Um, we, if, if it's something that's going to HCRC or likely to go to HCRC, we will inform the applicant what the HCRC is looking for in its review. But ultimately, we can't stop an application from coming to the HCRC because the code allows applicants to appeal uh, the completeness to the HCRC ultimately. So if they disagree with us about whether it's complete, they're going to the HCRC, but usually we are working with them prior to that point to make sure that um, the applicant is aware of what that review would look like if they did go to the HCRC without enough information, because generally the HCRC will not take action. Um, generally, these are the things, um, actually, Monica's asking a question that I just missed. Is the application and the accompanying documents like drawings considered legal documents? Um, example, documents with inaccurate information. Um, I mean, it's all sort of at the risk of the applicant. And so if they're submitting something that is uh, clean and accurate, they're not gonna have any problems in the process. If something's inaccurate, then they're gonna have a lot of roadblocks in their permitting process. And I'll, I'll show that later. Um, so it's really, it's really on them um, and in their best interest to make sure that what they're providing to us is accurate. Um, I missed a question earlier, administrative approval as opposed to what? And so a certificate can be approved two ways. So either we're doing it at the staff level rather quickly um, based on its eligibility for administrative approval or it's going to the full HDRC. And so that's that longer process that we'll speak at the next session. Um, so generally, um, requests are going to require a scaled site plan, uh, accurate drawings, plans and elevations, photos. Um, photos are very useful to us. Um, a lot of people try to uh, apply using a Google Street View screenshot, and those usually are not uh, up to date. And so having a decent and accurate photo of the site is very helpful, especially um, in determining whether work is occurred with or without approval. Um, material specifications, com the completed application, um, and then any clarifications as determined by staff in its completeness review. Um, so again, I mentioned that kind of gray area. Um, this, is, this is a good example. Um, so a lot of times we will, we will technically get drawings with dimensions on them, but they may not really reflect what the thing is actually going to look like. And so this is an example where we worked with the property owner to, to get more accurate drawings so that it is something that we could uh, place on an agenda for approval. Um, and so it's really about uh, the level of detail, the accuracy, um, making sure the drawing is scaled appropriately. And so um, 
you can see uh, the improvements in the drawings and what that means in our ability to review it and have a good understanding of what the proposed impacts to the historic resource are. Um, Ricky asks, what if it's possible not to photograph all sides of the building? Um, sometimes we have properties that are right up on the, the side yard uh, lot line, and so um, it is difficult, but we do ask that you try. Um, sometimes there's vegetation too, and you just can't see the building. Um, but um, as many photos as you can provide, the better informed the review will be. Um, Alex asks if we approve the builder or contractor, or he's getting ahead. Um, we we don't have um, the ability right now to to limit applications to certain builders or contractors. So anybody can submit the application. Um, we we do have a program called the Rehabber Club where we are incentivizing and rewarding uh, contractors that do good work and uh, are engaged in historic districts and some of our programs. Um, and so a lot of they very often are our applicants because people tend to use them. Um, but you do not have to be a certain, you don't have to hold a certain certification in order to submit a certificate of appropriateness application. Um, so about administrative approval, um, we've had several questions on this, so maybe this will clear it up. Um, the UDC determines what is eligible for administrative approval. Um, so we don't just get it and decide if staff likes it or if we think, think it's a good design to determine whether or not it's approved administratively or if it goes to the commission. The UDC tells us, and so there's a list um, of, of scopes of work that are eligible. And of course, those scopes of work must be consistent with any applicable rules or guidelines. So we're going to review those closely with um, other sections of the UDC to make sure that there's no uh, uh, inconsistencies, and also with our adopted historic design guidelines to make sure we're getting the best results anytime that we do something at the administrative level. Um, and again, like I said, those those applications can be revised to be eligible. So we might add stipulations or request that they change something in order to uh, be eligible for administrative approval. And most people are amenable to make changes. They they don't want to go through the full commission process if they don't have to, um, which which works in our favor. Like we want to uh, optimize the results in the process. We want people to do the right thing, and uh, we want projects to be consistent with the guidelines. So. Um, Having the ability to approve things administratively certainly encourages that type of work. Um, we do have a few resources that, that will be in later sessions. We call them our policy documents. Um, what they are is really just policy guides um, that explain um, how the historic design guidelines are largely um, administered. Um, what are the routine uh, actions of the HCRC? What, you know, if you're doing window replacement, what can you most likely re expect? Um, and so those are more in-depth guides to really guide applicants um, to get the best results possible. A lot of people also view administrative approval as a shortcut. Um, so they feel that if it's something that's small in scope and probably eligible for administrative approval, then they don't have to document it. And, and that's not true at all. Um, so the documentation requirements and the application requirements are the same, um, whether it's being reviewed administratively or if it's going to the full commission. Um, and so I mentioned the rules. Um, so again, we're reviewing against the UDC. Um, typically, if it's in a Rio district, if it's a signage request, um, right away impacts that that those standards and guidelines live in the UDC. Um, if it's a work on a historic landmark or a historic district, um, we're going to look at our historic design guidelines to make sure that that request is compatible with those guidelines. Historic signage, signage on a historic building. Um, landscaping, side elements, driveways, uh, sidewalks, those type of things would be the historic design guidelines. So the UDC gives us that 10-day completeness review, and then it gives us an overall period of 60 days to take action on a request before it's deemed approved. Um, so we are very mindful of when we receive the applications and when it's determined complete. Um, it's not 10 days plus 60 days for 70 days total. Um, we have we have 60 days total, and the, unless within that first 10 days we determine it's incomplete, and then that stops the clock. Um, an applicant can also ask to pump the brakes, and that would stop the clock. They can say, hey, I, I need to work on this a little more, or I'm not ready, or I definitely need time to work on uh, providing supplemental uh, application materials, and so they can stop the clock that way. Um, if a request is withdrawn, um, then we can do that in the system, and that will also not require further action. 
Um, and then ultimately, if a uh, request is approved or denied by the commission, then that 60 day review period is up and would not start again unless there was a future application. Okay, so that was the next little mini mini section. Are there any questions about what we just saw? Administrative approval, how we decide. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so looking at this again, just to reiterate, um, we just looked at the blue, uh, blue section. Um, so application comes in, we review it for completeness. We either approve it administratively or we prepare it for the HCRC. Um, and then once a COA is issued, that's this red workflow. Uh, there's gonna be plan and permit reviews if applicable. Um, and then from that review, there might be a couple of outcomes. Um, it's important to note that most things that require COA also require permit, but not everything. Um, so the best example is driveways. Um, there's not a permit required for flat work on a residential property that's less than 12 inches in depth. And so that's gonna be driveways, sidewalks. You could even pave a lot of your front yard just as a parking pad without a permit. Now that doesn't mean you don't need approval if you're in a store district. So, so the COA is still needed for that type of work in a store district. Um, again, this language, um, so the COA is valid for 180 days. Um, I'm gonna get into that in the next slide. Um, and then does not take the place of any required building permits. Um, so permit review. So this can happen at any point in the process. Um, it's really kind of a mixed bag in terms of, of when we are engaged for COA. A lot of people in historic districts and a lot of like architects and professionals that do work in historic districts know to come to us first. Um, so it's not too much of a problem, but we do have routinely permits that come in that are flagged for a review that don't have a COA on file. Um, and so um, a lot of times that's a trade permit. So something that probably doesn't require COA, like a like HVAC work or electrical work that's limited to the interior, but those permits are flagged. And then when they are flagged, we work with that contractor to determine if a COA is needed. If it is, they've got to come through the full application process and we review it like we normally would. And if it isn't, then we, we note that in the permit. Um, so if a permit comes in and there's no COA on file, um, then we um, either deny it or we determine it incomplete until that COA can be submitted. Um, whether or not we deny it or determine it incomplete is going to be based on the type of review, the type of permit, and then how much time we have to, to take action on it. Um, permits with COAs um, are reviewed for consistency with the approved scope. Um, and then I'll show you some examples of that in a little bit. Um, and then based on, on that consistency, where you're going, excuse me, <clears throat> we are either going to approve, approve with conditions or deny the permit. Um, and then revisions to a permit set would follow the same process. So it's not uncommon for somebody to come in uh, with a plan set for construction, get a permit, and then halfway in the project realize they got to change something. And so they will, they will submit revisions that are reviewed by all of the the reviewing agencies, which includes us. And so if there's a revision that happens, then we will look at the COA on file and make a decision based on the changes. Um, so this is a good example. Um, on the left, you see a project that came to HGRC. It's a rear addition. Um, so we're looking specifically at that rear elevation. You can see there's windows and a door. Um, on the right is the, the permit set that came in. So we do the plan review, we pull the, the plan set and oops, the windows are gone. So this is a case where we would uh, likely deny the permit that came in until the um, issue can be remedied. Um, in this case, he came back to HCRC with a revised proposal that was approved. And so we were able to approve a revised plan set that was consistent with what the HCRC saw. And this is, this is routine. So this is <laughs> something that a lot of people doesn't happen behind the scenes, but we are always doing permit reviews and plan reviews um, and comparing them to the COA approval. Um, we have a question from Barbara. Um, is there times when plans and drawings have to be in the COA so an applicant can't bring up revised drawings after an HRC is published with staff comments. This is gonna be a question for the next session. 
um, when we talk about exhibits that are submitted after a posting and what that looks like with the HTRC. Um, so again, uh, we are probably going to approve with conditions uh, depending on on the severity of the inconsistency. If it's something minor, then and it's for a, a large construction project, we might give them a conditional approval so that they can start doing construction uh, while we address the other item. Some items can also be addressed in the field, and so we may not know what the what the solution is until we get out there and we're at a certain stage in construction. Um, so we may allow a permit to proceed um, based on those conditions. Um, if there's no COA or a COA that is expired, and, and I'll talk about expired COAs in a little bit, um, then we most often deny it. Um, that really prompts the, the applicant to come to us quickly um, once they get the denial uh, notification because they want to resolve as soon as possible. Um, so the UDC says that um, in order that COAs do expire, they have a lifespan. Um, generally, they expire after 180 days or six months. Um, they don't expire if the project's continuing through the development process. And so if you have a COA on file and you are um, pulling permits or you're replatting the property or doing something related to your project, then that COA is gonna remain valid uh, during the life of the project. Um, if it has expired, um, then the code states that the applicant must request a reissue. Um, generally, we do reissue them, especially if it hasn't been expired for long and the thing that's coming in for a permit is identical to, to the COA. There's no, there's no reason for staff not to reissue it. Um, that's sort of our policy. But again, that's after we've confirmed that it's the same scope prior to um, reissuing that COA. Um, it's also possible that there are non-substantial changes to the scope. Um, if that happens, so if something comes in for permit review, say it's say it was this, but the window shifted over five feet instead of being scratched completely, um, we would revise the COA, amend the COA for that minor change. If it's a, not a minor change, then it may require additional action by the HDRC. The UDC authorizes the Historic Preservation Officer to determine if the change is substantial or not. Um, and so it's really just gonna depend on several things. It's gonna depend on what the project is, the, the size of the project. Um, if, it's, if it's a minor project to start with, then it's probably not going to be something that rises to the HDRC. Um, it's also gonna depend on what happened at the HDRC. And so if it was an item that was really looked at closely by the public and by the HDRC and had stipulations attached to it, then we're gonna pay more attention to making sure that that a revision to that item is fully vetted before we reissue. Um, so I mentioned here um, conditional approvals to allow for the start of condition or construction. Um, and then a lot of times when we get a, a permit for new construction is we have time before we have to take action to approve with conditions or deny. Um, so what a workflow that we've added and actually Monica is on the call and she's, she's sort of responsible for this <laughs> is, um, is a uh, new construction setback verification in the field before we issue the permits for new construction projects in the historic district. Um, so oftentimes what happens is when something comes to HTRC, it's not known at the time uh, what the true verified field setbacks will be. Um, they're usually demonstrating something graphically showing that they're going to conform uh, by meeting uh, the setbacks of adjacent historic properties. But it's hard to know what that actual number is. And then when something comes in for a permit, they're showing a number out of context. And so this field inspection form allows us to put that number back into context and ensure that the proposed setback is going to be consistent with the guidelines in terms of um, adjacent setback conformance. Um, so this is a field that we actually require the um, contractor to complete. It's important that it's the contractor because they're the one actually doing the work. Um, they, they do a sketch and they stake it out um, in the field where we go out and measure and verify and then both parties sign it. Um, that way, when we approve the permit and construction proceeds, if it's not consistent with this document, then we have the ability to really enforce it if we need to. And that could be a, a relocation of the structure, which is substantial. Uh, Barbara says, is there a list or definition of substantial changes? That's a good question. Um, the answer is mostly no, but so 
<laughs> when we say the word change, um, that could mean anything. So it could be something positive or negative. A change is a change. And so generally, we're going to look for something that's not a negative change. We're going to make sure that the change is still consistent or more consistent with the historic design guidelines or applicable rules than, than not. Um, Monica says, in the past, OHP has had a dedicated field inspector or two. Having one or two folks to do this is critical. Do we have dedicated inspectors? And if not, is there a plan to bring one on staff? Um, so we haven't reduced our staff. Instead, we've expanded the roles of the inspectors. And so, um, so yes, we do have dedicated field inspectors, but they're also, it's a higher level position and they're doing more things than those previous historic building assessor uh, inspectors were doing. Um, so right now, Hui Pham and Edward Hall are our primary enforcement staff. Um, Katie Topman is also part of that team, um, as well as myself. And so between the four of us, we are we are the building inspector. Um, and again, we do work with DSD as needed. If there's something that is um, uh, blurring the lines between historic review and DSD permit review, then we certainly engage DSD because it's just more hands, more eyes on the on the issue. Um, this is another field verification we do before we issue a permit for a metal re-roof. Um, so we've had plenty of instances where somebody has had a certificate to do a re-roof um, with stipulations and then those stipulations aren't met. Um, and it's very difficult to enforce because somebody just spent $40,000 on a roof and it's, it's hard to take that forward to municipal court um, uh, for a minor detail. Um, it just is not likely to get us the results that we want. So we found that we get better results if we work um, on the site with the contractor before they do the installation with this form. And so we're verifying that they understand the stipulations, know how to, or willing and able to complete them. And if not, then we send them back to HCRC for clarification of what the proposed uh, scene detail would be. So those are just two examples. Um, we're always looking to expand these um, to the ability that we can. Um, again, prevention is, is key in terms of these issues, and so we want to make sure that uh, when we issue a permit that, that the right work is going to be done um, and it's all documented uh, so that we can enforce it. Need to. Okay, questions on that section. Ricky asked um, when the inspections are performed, they are done as needed. Um, so usually uh, within a day or two, um, if, a, if a permit comes in for new construction, we're out there that same week doing the field inspection. As long as they're ready for us to do it, they've got to stake it out first. Um, and we, lately we've had um, a couple of dedicated days a week where we're primarily doing those. Um, also, if we do get a report um, to that email that somebody believes work is done outside of the scope, then we'll do an inspection then as well. So it's really kind of as needed on call. Um, we are proactive when we are out uh, in the field. We, we do um, inspections proactively as well. Um, Barbara asks, is there a way to inform the homeowner of liability of roof issue and subsequent fines? Yes, we, we do that all the time. It's just a matter of like, did the right person hear that? <laughs> so that's why we found that it's best to work with the contractor. Uh, Monica asks, how can we keep updated on work done out of the scope or without a COA that has been reported? Um, generally, if the person who did the report um, asks for a follow up, we will do that. Um, uh, I mean, we do have sort of, it's really, it's just a spreadsheet um, of of outstanding violations and which ones have been resolved and which ones are in the process of being resolved. Um, so we're, we're always able to provide that information if requested. Let's see. Matt asks, can you speak to the level of detail of drawings required to realize approval? For example, to get approved in Monta Vista to remodel a one-story garage into a garage with apartment above. Um, concern here is wasting a lot of money on drawings. So that's a good point, is you want to have some sort of indication if your project would be approved prior to doing the documentation drawings, which is a really good point. Um, we, just depending on the scope, we encourage you to work with either with staff or with um, the HDRC. Um, for something that's like an addition like that, then come in and work with staff and, and we can give you some indication of, of what would be required for documentation and what is likely to be approved. 
Um, if it's something that needs to go to the commission, then there's a process by which you can receive conceptual review. Um, so that's not going to require, there's, there's no minimum application requirement for conceptual review. You can come in with a sketch and get some feedback that way before you do the architectural drawings. But ultimately, the architectural drawings will be needed in order to receive the certificate. Um, Barbara asks, when we see something be done inappropriately, oh, I lost it. Um, who should report it to immediately, even on the weekend? Um, on the weekend, it's going to be 311. Um, we do receive those reports as well, but you're going to get the weekend staff out there immediately if you do that. Um, it'll be a, a DSD inspector. Um, and 311, as you know, like obviously it's a phone number, but there's also a pretty nifty app now that you can download and select the property. And so those reports can come in uh, very accurately now. Can you rein in E of A that tends, oh, the Board of Adjustment, um, if they approve something beyond the scope of the UDC authority that the HCRC has just approved? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll speak more to that in the next session, um, HCRC and appeals and kind of what that looks like. Um, the UDC does say that the BOA should consider or shall consider the exact same uh, application uh, that the HCRC reviewed. Um, a lot of times, however, the BOA does get uh, stories and information from the applicant that they tend to be more sympathetic with, and so you might get a different outcome. Um, but more, more of that in the next session. Um, we used to be able to go to your website, type in an address, and see a listing of approved COAs. Um, yes, that is still an option, but it's in a different place. It's on that Explorer map, um, and so there will be a demo of that in a future session. Um, we'll be able to see the approved COAs via the OHP map soon. The answer is yes, they're available now. Um, so if you go to that Explorer map, um, and if there, actually if there's time at the end of this, we'll just do a quick demo um, so that you all can see it. But you can browse by property, you can search an address, you can zoom in and see where recent approvals are, and you'll be able to view the approved uh, documents and the certificate. I don't believe 311 is closed on Sunday. Um, do you happen to have the Strike Force phone number? Yes, we can provide that. Um, I do not believe they are after hours, but they do work with the after hours staff. Okay, Rachel put the link to the Explorer map in. Um, after initial made is. Okay, I think we're good. Um, so let's go to a few resources. Um, generally, our philosophy is that we want this entire process to be as approachable as possible. That's, that's why we're doing things like this, is we want people to understand what it looks like um, and, and dispel some, some of the misconceptions about the process. Um, tend, you know, like Ricky's or Patricia said about um, the backyard thing, there's a lot of misconceptions that are, are often communicated within our own historic districts and with, even with um, people that are informed and um, do participate in the process routinely. And so we wanna make sure that um, it's easy to understand that everybody sort of understands what the, what the reviews look like and what the expectations are. Um, we wanna make sure it's accessible. Um, that's why we've worked so hard to provide as many online resources as possible. Um, we were actually very fortunate that we had all of this in place um, by the time COVID hit. If we hadn't have had our online portal, I'd, I'm really not sure what we would have done. Um, we would have had to do mail-in paper applications or something like that, and it would have been very inefficient. Um, that being said, not everybody has reliable internet, internet access, so we are, um, you know, we do work closely with our customers that do need assistance that way. But generally, we're finding that most people are able to use that online portal without much issue. Um, we also want to make sure it's affordable. Um, in many other cities, you know, we work closely with, with other large cities and other preservation offices to see what their policies are. And you would be surprised at how expensive it is to do work in a historic district in other places. Um, in Austin alone, I think to submit an application, it's almost like rezoning your property. It's hundreds of dollars for, for a certificate of appropriateness. Um, so here, um, there's no charge for residential scope of work. Um, that includes new construction. Um, 
the only charge is for HGRC review of a commercial project. Um, we try to be as fast as possible. Um, obviously, <laughs> just the, the nature of the city doesn't always allow us to do that. Um, but again, those administrative approvals um, for items that are eligible eligible for administrative review, we try to handle uh, within a day or two. Um, and all of this is designed to encourage people participating in the process and doing work with approval. Um, so it is our philosophy, and we train our staff on this, um, that we um, uh, work with our applicants so that they are informed in the process, um, that they aren't submitting an application and wondering what's going to happen to it so that they do have some good expectation of what of what the process will be. And so we always do an introductory email um, or a phone call with the applicant um, at the time that it's submitted. Um, we request additional information and explain why it's needed. Um, we do refer them to design review committee if, if requirement. Um, Gemma asked a question. Um, there is a charge for multifamily projects depending on the number of units. So that is the exception for residential. If it's multifamily, then, then it's treated as a commercial project. Um, and then we discuss with the applicant our recommendations and stipulations so they, they understand them. If it's something that is going to HCRC, then we do our best to prepare them for the hearing. Uh, we want to make sure that the conversation at the hearing is, is as informed as possible and that we're talking about the right things. Um, a few uh, services are staff consultation. And so we, we do it by, by video chat like this now, um, but we previously would sometimes have um, office hours where we are routinely scheduling consultations, pre-application meetings with applicants. Um, the, there is a process that DSD manages for pre-plan review. So if you have a larger project that has a multidisciplinary review, um, then all of those disciplines will sit in with you um, and we'll help you know what to expect in the process. And we participate in those for historic properties and downtown properties and, and you know. Um, again, the design review committee. Um, and then we do site visits as well. Um, very often the question is, can these windows be replaced? And so that's gonna require very often a site visit by staff to verify the condition in the field. Um, these are a few of our online resources, the Explore map. Let's go ahead and I'll, I will get to that in a little bit. Um, the policy documents I, I mentioned, um, uh, I can provide a link to those um, after. Actually, Rachel, if you wanna put a link in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, that before getting started page had the link to the historic homeowner handbook. Um, that is a printed resource that we provide at our annual historic homeowner fair, but it's also digital as well on our website, so you can have that. Um, instructional videos, there, there is a video that, um, that we put together that is step-by-step -step of how to use the portal. And so if you, if you get there and realize you need a guide, that video is available. Um, and then our design, review, our design resource center is also on that before getting started page. Um, this is just a Pinterest account, and it sounds kind of silly, but this was the easiest way to provide visual resources to our applicants that we could find. And so we, we link things from all over the internet, um, people looking for um, architectural details or um, architecturally appropriate designs um, that we can put. Um, yes, Rachel, go ahead and put a few of those links in the chat. Do the design guidelines and then a link to the policy documents on that EDC page. Um, and then also we, we actively put in, like, if we get a, a application that is well documented and a good example of the type of documentation that is needed for a certain project, then we'll put it on that, that Pinterest page as well. Um, so that we can show people what is needed for their, for the HGRC to consider their request. Um, so let me, let's do the explore map real quick. And there's probably going to be a little bit of a lag um, on your end as I do this. Um, but again, this is our homepage. Um, so this is where you go to get to the application portal, the HCRC schedule. Um, the Explorer map is right here. It's always going to be in this spot. Um, if you click on it, um, it looks a lot like um, the DSD one-stop zoning map, um, but it's specific to historic overlays and our program areas, as well as our, our survey and case information. Um, so what I'm going to do is zoom in a little bit so that it, it moves quickly for us. Um, the closer you are zoomed in, the fewer um, points of information it's going to pull up. Um, so it will be quicker for you, especially if you know where you're looking. Um, if I toggle on this blue dot OHP case layer, these blue dots represent anywhere where we have reviewed something. 
Um, and so you can see in our historic districts, it's pretty much every property. And then just outside, um, there's some dots. These are probably demolition reviews, unfortunately. Um, let me turn that off now. And I'm going to put in an address. I always use 222 King William because I can remember it. Same thing, it's going to um, load. Actually, I need to move this so I can select. It's going to load the addresses available in GIS. So I'll select from that list. And then it's going to show me that property on the map. So it's going to give me the basic information so I know I'm looking at the right one. Um, this is a link to the uh, BCAD uh, property details page so that you can get there easily. Um, this is survey information. Um, we're not going to have this for every parcel, but we do for a lot. Um, and so sometimes there's going to be information of year build, architectural style, um, the year it was surveyed. Um, and if it's something that we've identified as potentially eligible for designation, it'll be there as well. Um, this, there's multiple surveys over multiple years and the fields don't always line up. So there's going to be blank forms often. Um, but in more of our recent surveys, um, you will see all the fields filled and you will most likely get a photo, recent photo of the property as well. And so case info is what has come up in the chat. Um, so this is where to go if you're, if there um, is interest in reviewing uh, approvals on file, uh, the COA and then attachments with those requests. Um, we actually have one that's in progress right now. Um, we just got it today and there must not have been any attachments or it must not have been assigned yet. So those aren't showing up yet. Um, it's very fresh. Um, for a more recent one, uh, or I guess less recent, um, you'll be able to view the COA. This one went to HGRC for front yard fencing modifications. Um, the attachments are the files that are associated with that request. And so for an HCRC case, it's also always going to include the case file and letters associated with that review. So it came to HCRC, we got this letter, it's part of the record now. This is the HCRC case file, I believe. Yep, so that has staff's recommendations. So this is a really complete record of what happened with this request when it went to HCRC. And then again, this is the certificate of appropriateness. Now, if you get this, this is because I prefer to use Google Chrome. Um, this should work fine in Internet Explorer. Um, but if you use Chrome or another browser, uh, Firefox, um, you can download here where my cursor is. This is called an Internet Explorer tab. Um, it's very easy to install and it just stays on your browser. If you ever get a page in a browser that doesn't load, click on this and usually that will fix it. And so it's the same with these letters. Um, so you can see here we have our certificate of appropriateness on file. This is a summary of the commission action. Um, and so this is the record of the approval at HDRC. Pretty cool, huh? Um, we have a few questions in the chat here. So let me see if I get to them. They're, they're lengthy. Yes, we are recording the sessions. Um, Spore map works well for neighborhoods and allows us to see what's going on throughout the city. The weak link is the case info tab and PDF that will never load regardless of what device. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to, I'll have to help troubleshoot with you, Monica. This has always been kind of the fix. Um, another potential fix is, um, is this is producing a, a PDF report is how this is generated from our system. Another option is for the system to generate an HTML letter, um, and that reduces the removes the need to have the plugin. Um, but there are serious formatting issues with that too, and so it's it's we're trying to find what the lesser of two evils is. But we are we are trying to make sure that it works every time somebody clicks on it. Um, right now, the solution is that Internet Explorer tab. I don't know why it wouldn't work without that, but I'm happy to help troubleshoot. Um, Joe asks, this map is only used for addresses within the boundaries of a historic district, not in general. Um, primarily, it's, you're going to have more information for properties in a historic district, but it is a citywide map. Um, and I'll show you why. Let me zoom back out. Let's go to the Tobin Hill area and turn on our survey. So these are recent survey areas where there's a green dot. That means that we have done an architectural survey of that property. Um, our survey initiative is ongoing and active. And then we're also receiving very often uh, 
uh, survey information from volunteer groups like the Conservation Society. Um, so this is more recent, so I should be able to click on it. Click on that survey tab and yeah, I can see the, the recent survey um, information in the photo. Pretty cool. So this is actually newer construction. Um, let's see this one. I don't know why that one doesn't have a photo. Do you have to, there's one. So estimated year built style uh, survey area and then when we were out there. Yeah. Now, same with survey, we're gonna have demolition requests that are coming in throughout the city. Um, so an example would be, let's go over here. Another will be some. So these are all demolition requests. So if I click on that, it's gonna be the same. Hmm, that's weird. Another one. It'll be the same kind of records, uh, demolition owner initiated. And so you can see the application that came in. Some of these are older, and so the fields available are gonna be a little bit different depending on if it's archived data or not. Okay, any other questions about this map? Um, the other cool thing you can do is search by your neighborhood and then what's coming potentially to HDRC. Um, so let's go to, actually, sorry. We go to requests, and then I wanna see request status. I'm gonna say in progress, and in progress means that it's, it's come to us, but no action has been taken yet. Um, because we are pretty quick with administrative approvals, if an action hasn't been taken yet, it's probably because it's being scheduled for HDRC. And I can do this by district. Um, so let's do Monta Vista. Hit search. So these are all of the properties in Monta Vista that have a pending request. Um, if I click on one, oh, I sure hope this works. Let me move my window so I can see it. Um, this one's in progress. I don't think it's been assigned yet, so the attachments aren't available yet, or there were no attachments, and we're going to determine it and complete. Um, actually, this one should be acted upon. I don't know why that COA hasn't been issued yet. So this one. Okay, this one's in progress, and it does have the attachment available. And so you can see this came in yesterday. It's a request for roofing. I click on that, then it's a photo. Um, it looks like there's missing materials. I don't have the material uh, specification for the proposed re-roof, and so this is probably incomplete. And so these are all things that we're working through as a team actively to complete and take action on appropriately. And again, if you see something, you can always um, uh, contact staff. You can reference the case number, this request number, or the address, and we'll be able to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, um, with that, I think that we're at the end of our time. We got about 10 minutes left. Um, Monica says, I would like to know from folks here, have you all been able to read or download the, COA, the certificate PDFs like I just did? Um, she's on a Mac. I don't know that that would impact the, I know Scott's had the same issue. Monica, can I, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, what browser are you using? I am using Safari. I'm using uh, Firefox. Um, I'm on four different Mac devices, all with different OSs as recently as 2020. Um, Google Chrome. Yeah, I've tried the Chrome on one of them. And you were able to download the, the IE tab, the Internet Explorer tab? Nope. Right. That's, that's the key is if you, um, actually, let me, just, let me just show you. Yeah, I can't even get, I can't get it on my Macs for some reason. I guess they're just running old OSs. And I think that may be common, more common than not that um, not everybody's on the latest 
uh, release of an OS. So how do you websites on your Mac that require Internet Explorer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, seems like it could be something in your settings. Um, but I do, for everybody's reference, um, it is Internet Explorer tab. And then you get the plugin. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, a plugin that you can download on multiple browsers. I think Chrome is the most popular, but it basically will allow you to view a website as if you were using Internet Explorer. And so sometimes if you get a functionality issue on a website, this is the fix. Um, I think my, my OS is just too old. I think that's what it is on two of my machines. So. Um, but I'll continue looking. I may send something to you and uh, uh, another another navigation and you can share it with others too. Yeah, I mean, well, and we're still looking at the HTML option. It just, it does not look as much like a letter as this does. And then this has the ability to be printed and emailed in a little bit better fashion. Um, and so. And that's very valuable. Yeah, we're not completely sold on, on switching over to HTML, but that does solve the loading issue if you have it. Mm, okay. Well, I, um, I'll keep looking. I'll keep looking and working on it. Let's see. Tony previously asked if historic neighborhoods can participate in DRC meetings and make comments. Let's talk about that at the next session yeah. of DRC. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, if you think of anything else, um, let me know. If you are registered for this one, then you should have on your calendars all of the future um, invitations. And it's the same link. Um, so if you just have that link saved somewhere, you can rejoin that way. Um, we do have one more question. Um, does OHP oversee neighborhood conservation districts? Um, we do not. That is um, development services department. Um, generally, their, their zoning team is the one that reviews for conformance with those. Hey, Corey, this is yes, Barbara. I just got the number for the strike code. Can you hear me? Yes, the strike okay. code. It's a, it's a 210 and then 207 code. Isn't that great? There you go. <laughs> okay. um, So I was going to put it in there, but I was I can't really see when I type too well in there. Okay, the number is in the chat. Thanks. You need it. Um, one last question: How is your staff dividing time between inspections and paper reviews? Um, it's. Let me phrase it this way: There's not an allotted time for inspections. We just do it. <laughs> like if, if we need to do an inspection, we just do it. Yeah. Um, there's there's always something to do. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, again, we look forward to seeing you after the holidays at the HCRC session. Um, we'll do we'll do another e blast so that more people can join. Um, and again, if you think anybody else in your groups would benefit from that discussion, please go ahead and invite them. Um, and we'll see you all next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.